uh, good evening. So here we are today, uh, continuing with CL202. I'm trying to make this video lecture, and uh, please feel free to give me feedback. Uh, essentially, it is based on module six that I have already uploaded on Moodle, uh, and you probably have access to that. Um, so in my last class, I had finished uh, up to we have started with interval estimates right? and in today's class uh, we will continue with interval estimates so the broad area is statistical inferencing Okay. And in this broad area, uh, we were going to look at three topics. One topic was uh, point estimates. So the idea is that you have um, samples, you have n samples coming from a population. And from these n samples, um, <clears throat> you want to be able to find out a parameter of the population, which is in fact a parameter of the underlying uh, probability density. Oh. So the idea is that you have an underlying probability density which has described the probabilistic distribution of the samples, uh, but you don't know what is the parameter of that density. So the question therefore is, can you use those n samples to find out what the parameters, the unknown parameters are? So one is you give me a point estimate of that unknown parameter and the typical unknown parameter that I look at is the mean and the variance. So we are talking about the population mean and the population variance. Um, so one way is to give me a point estimate, which is what the maximum likelihood estimation did. It gave me theta hat. But remember that theta is a deterministic parameter in my setting and theta hat is a random variable uh, which is an estimate of theta okay so that was a point estimate then we started looking at interval estimates okay so in this case i will i should be able to give you an estimate of um, mu and sigma square in terms of an interval. So I should be able to give you a set. Okay. And be able to tell you that mu lies in that interval and I'll ascribe to that interval a certain confidence level. So we'll call them confidence intervals. Finally, the next module will be about hypothesis testing, which is you know, another way of looking at the same question which you're looking at using interval estimation. So that's the storyline. Now, uh, I've started recording, so let me now try to get my
desktop in so the so, so now we are going to talk about interval estimation and we i have already started this in the last class and we have already solved item number 1 that is if my samples x1 to xn belong to a normal distribution and let us say i have this very special circumstance where i don't know the mean of the population mean but i have the population variance available with me then can you give me an interval with a certain confidence level about uh, for mu the second item will be which we will uh, subsequently do will be uh, where both the mean and the variance are unknown let me pick up the pencil so these two are going to look at an estimate for mu in one case the variance the population variance is known in the other case the population variance is unknown what you will know you will collect a sample and what you will have is a sample mean which we have been calling it as x bar so this will be available to you but this is not what we are interested in we are interested in the true population mean which we will try to provide as an interval the third problem is about finding the estimate for a for variance so we will try to find out what is an interval for an a variance so this is also a case where both the mean and the variances are unknown the fourth case we have uh, a situation where you have two different populations so this could happen uh, so these are known as two population statistics so it's not just one distribution there are two distributions and for example you have a case where the mean is uh, the mean uh, and the and the variance of a particular treatment so let's say you have nowadays in this times of the virus you can say that there is a treatment a and there is a treatment b so the treatment a gives you belongs you know leads to a certain population with a certain mean mu a and sigma a square and a certain mean and variance mu b and sigma b square and you would like to have an idea about which treatment is better so those kind of questions you can answer using the last two aspects over here and this of course is when you have a binomial distribution you would like to know an idea about or from let us say doing a poll would like to know uh, a proportion or the probability of success as we called it in the binomial distribution and in all these cases we will talk about it in form of a sample okay all right so let me start so let's start with this or this i have already done i'm going to recap really quickly as to uh, how can you give me an interval for mean mu when sigma square is known so this is really an unusual situation where you don't know the population mean but for some you know you know the population variance so it is an a, a more unusual situation but it cannot be uh, discounted completely for example let us say that there is a process and uh, you have made a change in the process where you think that the variance of the new after making the shift is same as the previous variance so there is no spread in there is no change in the way that your sample spread but there is a change only in the center or the mean of that so for example you have some distribution like this this is let us say old you made some change the same curve is lifted and put somewhere else okay next to it so the variance of both these distributions could be same but uh, the means are different and so this is that situation where you don't know the mean but you know the variance now the setting is as we said all our samples come from a known distribution and we already know that the sample mean is distributed in this particular fashion even if xi do not belong to the normal distribution we can appeal to the central limit theorem and uh, see that the sample mean is roughly normal in under certain circumstances 
So the way we proceed is we can standardize that variable by subtracting out the mean and dividing by the standard uh, deviation. And we know that this therefore belongs to a normal distribution with mean zero and uh, variance one. So let's see how we can proceed. One more level of, uh, of nomenclature for you to recall is that we will keep referring to this as the uh, as the 100 into 1 minus alpha percentile point, okay? So Z alpha, or we'll call it as a quantile, okay? So we will refer to it as a quantile. So when we say that this is Z alpha, it means that the probability, if you go mark that point on that axis, then the probability to the right of it, the right tail probability is equal to alpha. And therefore, the, on the, the probability or the area uh, on the left will be 1 minus alpha. So this is a very general notation. If, if you give me any distribution, let me try to draw something really funny here and say that uh, this distribution has the 100 into 1 minus alpha percentile point. Uh, let me call it V is the dummy variable. So V alpha means that the probability on this side is equal to alpha. And therefore, by corollary, the probability over here is 1 minus alpha. Okay, then this becomes V alpha. Or I will call it as 100 into 1 minus alpha percentile point of that distribution is how we could refer to it. All right. So let's uh, start uh, by talking about uh, how we could find out that interval. Again, this is a recap. I've already done it in the class. And, and the way that we started was we said that we can start by talking about the random variable x bar. We know its distribution by saying that the probability of x bar lying between a lower limit and an upper limit u is equal to 1 minus alpha. Okay. Unfortunately, uh, um, this is not a standard distribution. And so we could make it into a standard distribution by subtracting out the mean on both sides and dividing by the standard deviation of x bar which is sigma by root n and since you know sigma you can actually calculate you know you could actually go ahead and process this information so if i can show it on the board just to recap here So I want, uh, I think I'll have to blow up the video and not forget to, there you go. Yeah. So if you want 100 into 1 minus alpha percent interval, you will put the uncertainty, which is alpha, on either tails of that interval. This is known as a two-sided interval. Okay. So... All right, and then you can say, uh, you can start off by saying, So as I have shown on the board, the left hand side 
can be written as that percentile point z of 1 minus alpha by 2 because the probability on the right side of this point of this point is uh, 1 minus alpha by 2 okay uh, let me and go back okay however it turns out that because this is symmetric then uh, z of 1 minus alpha by 2 is same as uh, minus of z alpha by 2 okay so this is same as this number over here and that is just because it is uh, symmetric this is not true in every case so so now you can see from the derivation on the board that what you get here is 1 minus alpha for a 9 for 1 minus alpha being 90.95 which corresponds to a 95 percent confidence interval um, we can we know that this value is nothing but z of 0 0.025 is 1.96 and so when we substitute that value we can write it as such so this is the probability that this random standardized uh, unit normal or standardized normal variable lies between minus 1.96 and plus 1.96 you know that um, roughly 95 percent of the probability lies between plus minus uh, 2 sigma so you can see uh, that about 95 percent of the probability lies between not plus minus 2 sigma but in some sense plus minus 1.96 sigma that is more accurate um, and, and, and this is just a this statement is only a reflection of that. So just to remind ourselves what is it that we were trying to get? We were trying to find out what is an interval estimate for mu when sigma square is known. So while we have stated here quite the obvious, we still do not have that. So let's move on to the next page. And you will see that you could do algebraic manipulations and you would be able to write this statement as follows only the moment you write this statement you realize that mu is a deterministic quantity and you cannot be claiming that this is a probability for mu because mu does not have any probability associated with it so i will not stop calling this as a probability and call it as a 95 percent confidence interval instead so there you have it this is the 95 percent confidence interval that we have so far so I hope that is clear. Now this is an example where supposing that you had a signal that you were transmitting from location A and it was being received at location B. What you were transmitting was mu but at B you were receiving it as mu plus n where n was a normal variable with mean 0 and variance 4. So there you have it. You know the variance of this distribution. So the mean of mu plus n is therefore mu, which is the unknown being transmitted from A. And the variance of mu plus n is therefore just 4. Now, you send that same value of mu 9 times, but every time you send it, you get a different number on at location B. And you can see that you have a number as small as 5. And that same mu has sometimes appeared as 15. The question that you have is to construct a 95% confidence interval for mu. So in this case, you could easily find out the sample mean. But sample mean is not what we are interested in. We want an estimate for mu, the population mean. And then we could go ahead and build this estimate. If you do it, you find that the, esti the sample estimate is, seven points, is between 7.69 and 10.31. So these are the two confidence limits, the lower limit of the 95% confidence interval and the upper limit. So you should realize that in a confident, in an interval estimate, we do not give you a point value. Instead, we would give you a, an interval and ascribe a confidence with that interval. Okay, so I hope that is clear. So the question is, what does a 95% confidence interval mean? 
and the way that you can uh, interpret it is that if you were to do 100 experiments and in each experiments you had those nine observations so you would be able to uh, generate 100 different confidence intervals so a 95 percent confidence interval means you would be able to generate 100 of those 95 percent confidence intervals so a 95 percent confidence interval means that 95 of those 100 95 percent confidence intervals would have the true mean embedded in them okay so you can see that these are one two three four five different values and you can see that some of those confidence intervals you did those nine uh, values you collected and you generated a confidence interval but it did not have the mean so remember this is the mean mu but you have a confidence interval which did not have the mu in it okay the true value of mu in it so that is the interpretation of a 95 percent confidence interval that in the long run 95 percent of these intervals will contain the true population mean that you were trying to seek all right so this is what a two-sided confidence interval is you can also you will also agree that without knowing sigma you would not have been able to calculate this particular confidence interval so because in order to do that you needed the value of sigma so so this is a sample mean but this is so this is a sample mean but this is the value that you would need now in addition to having a two-sided confidence interval very often a one-sided confidence interval is also used so in this case we think of uh, of the uncertainty alpha being put completely on one side of that distribution so when you talk about an upper uh, one-sided confidence interval we decide to put that entire uncertainty on the right side okay and when you talk about a lower one-sided confidence interval we decide to put the entire uncertainty on the left side so again you can draw a graph um, of a distribution put alpha and write down the probability and very easily obtain this maybe i can show that to you on the board so let me blow this up so i i will draw a distribution and i will put all the uncertainty on the right side Okay. Now you can start off by saying that, that that the probability of x bar is less than a. Now you standardize the variable by subtracting the mean and dividing by the standard deviation. And that probability should be 1 minus alpha. So I will put here as 1 minus alpha. So from here, this is the probability. But what you can try to obtain is the confidence interval. <coughs> and so you will be able to show that, that mu belongs to this particular interval. So that will be 100 into 1 minus alpha percent upper confidence interval. So notice that in an upper confidence interval, you have the lower bound. Okay, this is the lower bound. <coughs> that means the mu exists somewhere in this in this interval. So it is definitely greater than the lower bound. And in the lower one-sided confidence interval, you have an upper bound for the mean. So if you're wondering in what circumstances you would use uh, such, let me check if I have minimized my. So if you are wondering under what circumstances do you use uh, such a lower bound and upper bound, then think about 
a uh, manufacturer, let's say, of a mobile phone who wants to be able to claim that the mean life of the mobile phone instrument is greater than five years. Okay, so he will, he or she will try to show that the mean, the population mean, therefore belongs to this upper one-sided confidence interval, saying it is anyway greater than uh, five years. If there is an, a regulating agency that is trying to uh, check the truth of in the advertisement, will again buy, let us say, 10 or 15 mobile phones of that particular manufacturer and then try to calculate the lower one-sided confidence interval to show that, that the mean is at most this value. So note that this becomes therefore an upper bound. Okay. So it is really a two-player game. If you were manufacturing uh, uh, some food item in which there was some toxic element, then you would show that the toxic element is this below a particular limit. So then you would try to prove, you would try to show this bound. Now, if there was an FDA that wanted to check whether what you say is true, would take samples and try to therefore use the upper confidence interval. So depending on the situation, you have to be able to decide whether it makes sense to use an upper confidence interval or a lower confidence interval or a two-sided confidence interval. So again, we go back to our problem of where mu was transmitted from, from A, from location A to location B. And, uh, um, and uh, you want to now, you already found out the two-sided confidence interval. It was this. But you would like to find out the upper 95% confidence interval. So it is 7.903 to infinity. Okay. So here you can claim that the mean value of mu, which was being transmitted from location A, is... With 95% confidence, you can say that it is greater than 7.903, okay? And with a 95% confidence, uh, uh, confidence, you can claim that that mu value is less than 10.097, okay? And the two-sided confidence interval is what we already looked at, calculated. So you know how to calculate these upper and lower confidence intervals using these formulas that we just discussed. All right. Now, another interesting uh, issue that uh, develops is when you would like to give a range to your 95% confidence uh, interval, uh, let us say you did a mobile phone 95% confidence interval and you got that it lies anywhere with the two-sided confidence interval and you got it could be anywhere, the mean life could be between two years and 10 years. So such a confidence interval does not inspire too much confidence because you say, oh, you know, it could break after two years or it could survive up to 10 years and you're not very sure. And so you would like to give a confidence which is more meaningful, okay? So in order to do that, so the question is that if you think about your confidence interval, then the range or the size of that confidence interval is is uh, two times x bar minus mu okay so it is the upper confidence limit minus the lower confidence limit turns out to be this okay but you don't want it to be going from two years to ten years you want it you're okay if you say it goes from four and a half half years to five and a half years so how can you accomplish this? So one way of accomplishing this is by uh, finding out how many sam what should be the size of the sample if you want it to be have a desired uh, range of that confidence. Okay. So you could just do simple algebraic manipulations and show that if your range given range to you is two times x bar minus mu, then n should be uh, should be this. Okay. Uh, so this tells you that for a given range, that is x bar minus mu or captured by x bar minus mu and known variance sigma, 
And if you choose your alpha to be 0 0.05 in case of a 95% confidence interval, how many samples should you have? So that you get this range, okay? So it has to, it has been shown very nicely over here. This is the lower limit over here. This is the upper limit, okay? And you want some, some, uh, uh, you want some kind of a, control on how wide this is and using this particular formula you could find out uh, how many samples you should have okay so if you want this to be narrower you need to be able to have more samples and this you can see is n is inversely related to uh, square of x bar minus mu okay so smaller x bar minus mu you know n will increase uh, in that proportion Again, if you, so you will need more samples if the normal spread as of, uh, of that population, sigma is large. So if you want x bar minus mu is fixed and, um, but sigma is large, then you will have to pay a penalty by choosing more number of samples. In the same way, if you want, a, a, instead of a 95% confidence, you want 99% confidence then also you, your number of samples will have to go up in order to provide you with the same range. Okay, and That is quite clear from here that as uh, Z of alpha by 2 increases as alpha decreases. So when you have 95%, then what is the value of alpha? It is 0 0.05. And if you choose 99%, then what is the value of alpha? It is 0 0.01. So as alpha decreases, that means the confidence inter the the 100 into 1 minus alpha percent confidence interval, uh, or you have a higher confidence interval, then the number of samples will have to increase in order to give you the same uh, range or span of that confidence two-sided confidence interval. Okay. And so you can use this figure to be able to make that uh, assessment. That as 1 minus alpha goes up, alpha comes down. And so your z of alpha by 2 is getting pushed more and more to the right over here. Okay. So let's come to the more usual case where you neither know mu nor do you know what is the variance sigma square. So in this case, like we did before, you can no longer use this and why is that because you don't know what is sigma so an obvious intuitive choice is to replace sigma with s okay so when you use sigma your you could we could show that this was the underlying distribution when x i were normal x i belong to the normal distribution the samples okay but if you replace sigma with if the sample variance uh, or sample standard deviation, it turns out that this is no longer normal. In fact, we can show that this belongs to a T distribution or a student's T distribution, which is, um, which is, uh, you know, can be written as a ratio of a normal variable and the mean average of a chi-square variable. So we have z, which is the unit normal, divided by a chi-square variable uh, with n minus 1 degrees of freedom in this case, because it is t n minus 1, and it is divided with its own degrees of freedom. So that is your t variable, okay? It's known as a student's t distribution. Just like chi-square is a distribution, we had seen the form of the distribution, we plotted it in R. In the same way, this is a standard distribution. You can write it, write down the equation, and you can plot it. So here are some more details, so as I discussed with you, that it is a ratio of the unit normal and a chi-square, mean chi-square distribution. Why I call it a mean is because I divide it by the degrees of freedom n inside that square root. And so this is known as a t-distribution with n degrees of freedom. Okay. 
Now this distribution looks very similar to, let me check whether I have minimized my own video. Yes, so you can see the desktop. So in this case, you have, a, um, it looks very similar to a normal distribution, except that it has heavier tails, okay? And now uh, T distribution is, it depends on the degrees of freedom. So this is T2 is one density, T3 is another density. So as the number of variables change, we keep getting a new curve for that particular density. So shown to you are a few of those curves. When n was 2, when, and for us, the degrees of freedom really in, relate to the you know, observations, the number of observations. So you can see that when you had only 2, then you had this distribution, which was compared to the unit normal, which is the red curve, is more heavy tailed. So you can see this is n is equal to 2. And this is the normal distribution. So as you increase, you go from 2 to number of observations becoming 5, you will see that this has gone closer to the unit normal. Okay. So as the number of samples or the degrees of freedom keep on increasing, you keep approaching the unit normal. In fact, you get the no unit normal distribution as n tends to infinity. In fact, um, when n is about equal to 30, you can hardly distinguish in the first few decimals between the normal distribution and the t distribution. Okay, So the difference that you find is that a normal distribution is, uh, is uh, narrower, whereas a t distribution has a heavier tail. And you should be able to rationalize that in a t distribution, the only difference was that you replace the true population variance or standard deviation with a sample population standard deviation. So whenever you go from here to here, you have more uncertainty associated with it. And where does that uncertainty reflect? It reflects in the heavier tails of this. So if your sample you have calculated based on larger and larger number of samples, it becomes more and more like a unit normal. All right. So, um, and aside that, the student's t distribution was actually proposed by Gossett, and uh, but he never used his own name in his publication, and he used a pen name, which was student. So people thought there was some one student whose name was Mr. Student or Dr. Student, Mr. Student most likely, who um, uh, had proposed this, this distribution. It is uh, thought that you know it was his, it was his idea of uh, lifelong learning that he chose that pen name. Um, other reason why people say that he used this distribute this uh, pen name is to hide his own identity. Um, he worked at a brewery and he didn't want they didn't want their competitors to know that they were probably using some kind of statistical test to make sure that their quality is is uh, is maintained. Uh, consistently. Okay, so something, some more information about a t-distribution. Like the unit normal, the mean of a t-distribution is zero, and for n greater than two, you can see that the variance one can easily calculate using the standard uh, definition of variance uh, uh, as n over n minus two. So you can see from here also that as n becomes larger and larger, this quantity tends towards one, which is the variance of that unit normal towards which, towards which that density tends to. Like we discussed before, we have a quantile point that we will refer to. Now here the quantile point is T of alpha comma N, and uh, that says that the probability on the right side of T of alpha comma N is equal to alpha. So if I go back over here and on this blue curve, I make then this value over here is um, going to be T of uh, alpha, which is this comma 2, because this is based on degrees of freedom 2. So this tells me that the curve 
between this and if I were to trace out that blue line, this area is alpha. And the area in the remaining part is 1 minus alpha. Okay, so that will be T of alpha by 2. How do you get it? You can get it from a table, okay, or you can get it from a code, a, a software such as R. Like uh, in case of the unit standard normal, you find that T of 1 minus alpha is equal to minus T of alpha by alpha because of symmetry. So again, if I go here, then I know that by the definition, this value should be T of 1 minus alpha. But this value of T of 1 minus alpha is equal to minus of T alpha and that is because it is symmetric around uh, 0. All right. So the next question is, okay, now that we have defined what is the underlying density of the standardized variable, which is this in the case where I don't know what is the variance of the population, how do I find that confidence interval? And you do the same exercise again. So you start off by saying that the probability of X bar lying between a lower limit and an upper limit is 1 minus alpha. Okay. And the next step for you to try is you center it by subtracting out the mean and you divide it by the sample variance which is s by root n and if you do that uh, you can then find out what is the uh, you know and so you, you will be able to write it in this particular fashion as i said again that you do algebraic manipulation so that you have only mu in the middle and then you stop calling this a probability and instead you call it a 100 into 1 minus alpha percent confidence interval. So that's the two-sided 100 into 1 minus alpha percent confidence interval when both mu and sigma square are unknown. So you'll see that the only difference is that in that, in the previous case when sigma square was known, we had used the unit normal distribution, okay? And in this case, we are using a T distribution because that is the distribution to which the standardized variable belongs to once you divide it using the sample standard deviation. Okay, so similarly, you can define an upper one-sided interval and a lower one-sided interval. I hope you will you can see the the connection with the case with the previous case when sigma square was known. Now, one thing you might want to take note is that we have used the capital X bar and the capital S over here. And here we have used the lowercase X bar and lowercase S. So in case where we want to refer to this as a random variable, we use the uppercase. And when we are substituting the realization of that uh, variable, so this is a numerical value, we have used the lowercase. Let's go back to our original problem of finding out the value of a term or a value of mu, which however was, ref was obtained on uh, location B, not as mu, but is corrupted with a noise being mu plus n. And in this case, you neither know the mean, you neither know the value of mu nor do you know the variance of uh, this particular variable. So what is the mean of this variable is mu. What is its variance is sigma square and both of them are unknown. So all you have are these nine realizations, which are the same values, the minimum value being five, the maximum being 15. And you're told to give a 95% confidence interval for that population mean mu. So like we discussed, you calculate the sample mean, you calculate the sample standard deviation, and then we use our 95% confidence interval. What you will need is this, okay? 
and where will you get this from you can get this from a table uh, or you can get it from r for example i think i have something open here so the name of the distribution is t when i use it in r and so i want the quantile information so i say qt uh, the probability i want on my right side is uh, is uh, what was the probability it was 0 0.025 on the right side so this typically gives you the probability distribution which is the left side probability if you recall the definition of a distribution uh, the degrees of freedom are n minus 1 so i'll put an 8 here and but since i want a right side i can say tail dot lower uh, is equal to false okay there is some error i'm assuming it is I'll use this correctly qt so i made some error somewhere so p is 0 0.025 8 and i want to say lower tail is equal to false and is 2.3 okay so you can see it is 2.306 so it's this t distribution with a heavy tail and if you say that the probability on the right side is 0 0.025 it has told me that this number over here is 2.306 i don't have to calculate this because i know by symmetry this is minus 2.306 and so i use from that sim simple evaluation Interestingly now, the interval has become 6.63 to 11.37, so it has increased. So, uh, so when, when we had used uh, a Z distribution where we said that the variance is known, our interval was much smaller in, uh, in its range. It was from 7.46 to 10.54, whereas in the present case it has increased, so there is more uncertainty. So now you can agree or you can uh, realize that since uh, when we were using the Z distribution, we had a narrower density. And when we are using a uh, T distribution, we have a wider density. So this value, the T of 0 0.025 is much larger than the T, than the Z of 0 0.025 over here. Okay, And this is why... So, so this was 1.96, so Z of 0 0.025 was Z was 1.96, whereas T with 8 degrees of freedom turned out to be 2.306. And that is why you get a much larger uh, range of that two-sided confidence interval. Okay, so uh, now let's move on and go to the next case, which is con uh, finding out the a confidence interval for the variance. So while the confidence intervals of mean are very commonly used, there are cases where you would like to know the confidence interval of a variance. Uh, for example, let us say you have a you have a process. So let me think of. Uh, let us say you are making a uh, uh, a product which has and the customer gives you a target and tells i will buy the product only if the target is this okay now since you know that there is a lot of variability in your process uh, and there is a large variability so you try to make much superior than the customer's target so that even with poorly formed uh, products you can still meet the customer's specification. So an example we have done is that if you don't meet the specification, you, the customer will not pay you. But in order to make sure that you get paid by the customer, you have ended up trying to make far superior product. Okay. So let us say you, you and that is because your variance is large. So let us say you make a change in your process and you say that with this changed process, 
I can give you a product, uh, I can give you a process with far lower variability. So let's say I can make it like this. If I do this, then I have to make, you know, because remember that when you're making a far superior product, the customer is paying you only for the quality that his or her target is specifying. So if you can make a product which is very tightly or the variance of your process is very tightly uh, aligned with the target value given to you by the customer, then uh, you, you need not waste so much of your money. So your margin of profit will increase. So this is a case where you would like to test for variance. You want to make sure or you want to find out what is the confidence interval for the variance. Okay. So when I say test for the variance, I really meant estimate the variance in form of an interval. Uh, let us say 95% confidence interval for my variance. So it's the same old trick. We have samples which are coming from a normal distribution. Like for X bar, you knew what were the underlying distribution. So now for the sample variance, I will need to find out what is the underlying distribution. We had seen this before and we had seen that you could write this as a chi-square distribution with n minus 1 degrees of freedom. Okay. So the moment that the distribution becomes known, I can now start finding out the confidence intervals. In this case, uh, the chi-square distribution, and we have plotted the chi-square distribution in R. And we had seen that as you have more, higher degrees of freedom, which for me really means higher the number of observations, uh, it becomes less and less skewed. So this is a highly skewed distribution over here. And as your number of uh, degrees of freedom increase, it becomes less and less skewed. We had also seen that this was related to the gamma function. In fact, we had written down the entire uh, density for chi-square. Now, unlike the Z distribution, the T distribution, which was symmetric, because of the presence of the skew in a chi-square, this is no longer symmetric. So when you will try to find out the confidence, a two-sided confidence interval, um, you should take care that if you're finding out, let us say, 90% uh, confidence interval, so you're saying that I'm going to put 5% of the uncertainty in the right tail, a 5% uncertainty in the left tail then you will no longer have that same property that you enjoyed in the previous two cases uh, where they were symmetric. So now uh, chi-square 0.05 will mean that this is 18.31. So remember that a chi-square distribution only starts from zero. So you don't have a negative value. So there's no question of being symmetric around the origin. And a chi-square 0.95 is not equal to so there is no notion of a minus chi-square okay, or minus 18.31 because it starts only from zero. Okay, So you have to be able to find out both these uh, percentile or quantile points. Okay, so you do the same trick that we have been doing. Okay, maybe I will just do it on the board. blow this up okay and yeah so I can use this so I will do I will draw the chi-square I will put alpha by 2 on one side alpha by 2 on the other side and then I should be able to write down the probability statement from where I can uh, obtain the uh, the uh, confidence interval for a square Okay. And now you can, you can, you know, convert into a standardized variable. And after converting into a standardized variable, before I forget, uh, I should minimize this. Otherwise, you will not see any of the screen. And okay. So now you should be able to see my desktop. 
So, so then by standardizing it, you will be able to write that probability statement uh, for the standardized uh, case. And then you will convert it using algebraic manipulation and note that sigma square is no longer a random variable. So I will not write it as a probability, but instead call it a confidence interval. So the two-sided 100 into 1 minus alpha percent confidence interval is given by this. As we discussed before, you have a lower and then upper confidence intervals as well. So I will urge you to think about situations where you would use a lower confidence interval and upper confidence intervals and also situations where you would want uh, two-sided confidence intervals. Okay, so when we solve problems, hopefully some of these will become clear. So let's take an example where there is a company that produces washers and these washers have a thickness and the thickness is found to be uh, to be the following in inches as they have given over here. So it's if the process is very tight, is very good, then you will keep getting consistent performance. And if the customer has said that I want washers of let's say 0.12 inches and your process is very tight, then you will not have to spend so much material because when you're making a washer with 0.133, thickness, you are giving more material, that product costs you more, but the customer pays you only for 0.12. So you would like a tight variance on it. That is why you want to have a confidence interval on the on the population variance. Okay. So again, we calculate <coughs> a square and we can find out what is the sky square point. Okay. Uh, again, you have a table. I will urge you to go to the table because an exam Assuming you're going to give an exam, okay, you will have to uh, use a table, okay. But um, in this case, I can, for example, calculate what is chi square 0 0.05 with 9 degrees of freedom and 0 0.95 uh, in R. So let me just do one of them so chi square, and what I need is Q chi square with the 0 0.05 comma degrees of freedom were 9 and I will make lower dot tail as equal to false and you can see that this is the quantile point and that is 16.917 as we as you know 918 or 919 in my case, and which is 0.917 is written over here. So this is probably, uh, you know, so you I will urge you to solve this using a table. Maybe in my next lecture, I will show you the table because the table does not have so many points where you can interpolate it very finely. So in the while solving problems, you should know how to interpolate when you're using a table. In any case, this is the confidence interval. So it tells you that the, the standard deviation lies between 2.7, if I can call it a milli inch, and 6.1 milli inches, okay, which is pretty tight. But then you can make a uh, change in your process and see whether I have been able to uh, make more consistent delivery of washers in the changed process. Okay, so. Uh, some tricks that you have to remember when we looked at a sample, we knew that we could relate it, we could standardize it like this. When we looked at the sample mean, we could standardize it like this. And when we looked at a sample variance, we standardized, we standardized it like this so that you could relate it to known distributions. Okay, So if xi belongs to the normal distribution, then this is the unit normal. This also is, can be connected to the unit normal. And this is connected to the chi-square distribution with n minus 1 degrees of freedom. Okay. So, as I discussed in the beginning that so far we have looked at, at one population. So, there were washers, they were belonging to one population. 
when we talked about um, you know transmitting that mu to the location b it was a single population but very often confidence intervals and statistical inferencing is desirable when you have two different populations and often the question is whether the mean of one population is higher or lower than the mean of the other population so this is the next problem that we will look at so here you have two populations one is x1 x2 to xn so you have n samples here coming from popul from this population which belongs to mu1 sigma1 square and the y's are the samples which are m number of samples different number of samples coming from a separate normally distributed population which is has mean mu2 and sigma2 square so one common question is is mu1 greater than mu2 or smaller than mu2 but you don't know what are the values of mu1 and mu2 what you have is only x1 to xn and the m samples from y1 to yn okay and from this you have to be able to make a comment on which population mean is larger or smaller so as i was saying that in these days of the virus let us say that there is somebody who comes with vaccine a and you have x which tell you the days required to recover if a vaccine a is used and you have vaccine b and the samples that you collect correspond to patients who have administered vaccine b okay now you want to know if it is time days required to recover from that virus after administration of a particular vaccine you would like to know whether mu a is bigger than mu b or mu a is smaller than mu b so the faster you recover you will want to recommend that particular vaccine so you are interested in solving this particular question which one whose population mean is smaller and the one that is smaller will be a preferred treatment so like the previous case we will consider two cases here in one case we will magically assume that sigma 1 and sigma 2 are known that is the population variances are known and in the other case we will assume that they are not known so you could very quickly calculate the sample means coming from population x and the population and the sample mean coming from the other population as x bar and y bar okay now these are also the maximum likelihood estimators or point estimators for mu1 and mu2 the question is i would if you have seen we always want like to know what is the underlying distribution so that we can build confidence intervals so if xi and the yi's were normal as claimed over here coming from these two populations then from what we know is that you could find out assuming that xi and y i's are independent you can show that the normal that x bar minus y bar will have also a normal population with the population mean being mu1 minus mu2 the subtraction of the means okay and however their variances will add up because when you and so you can do this on your own with concepts that we have learned so far that if i give you two samples x i's and y i's and you have to add up or you have to subtract in this case then the means will get subtracted but the uncertainties will not get subtracted so subtracting out does not mean in fact the uncertainty will increase because you have the uncertainty in x and you have the uncertainty in y and because they are independent they will just add up in this particular fashion okay so that is the underlying distribution of x bar minus y bar okay so sigma square 1 square by n was the variance of x bar sigma 2 square by m is the variance of y bar so the variance of x bar minus y bar is this and you can verify that even the variance of x bar plus y bar would have been the same okay so we have done this now enough number of times so you know how we will proceed we will we know the underlying distribution so we'll subtract out the mean which is mu1 minus mu2 and we will divide by the standard deviation then we know that the underlying 
the standardized variable will belong to the unit normal will be distributed as the unit normal so that is what has been done over here the moment you do that you can write down the probabilities for that standardized variable and as we have done before it turns out to be this that the probability that the standardized variable lies between minus z alpha by 2 and z alpha by 2 is 1 minus alpha so the most important step is this to know what is the probability of a of the standardized variable okay or what is the distribution the probability distribution of the standardized variable the moment you do this, you now do algebraic manipulations like before and get mu1 minus mu2 in, this, in the middle. So you know this is no longer the probability, but instead we will call it the confidence interval. So again, magically you know what is sigma1 and sigma2. In that case, this is gives you the confidence interval, which I hope is summarized in my next slide. So that is over here. So mu1 minus mu2 belong to this confidence interval and this is the 100 into 1 minus alpha percent two-sided confidence interval. Okay. So if you give me this confidence interval and let us say that the two numbers are, are minus 5 comma minus 1. So which population mean is smaller than which is a question which you should think and try to answer. If it was between minus 5 and plus 5, then what can you say? If let us say it was between 1 and 5, then what you can say? Okay, So you should be able to make those interpretations with what we have discussed so far. Okay, so let's quickly look at an example. You have uh, Two different types of electrical cables, cable insulations, and these have been tested at uh, voltage levels at which failure occurs. Okay, so you have a cable, you keep on increasing the voltage, and at some point the insulator no longer acts like an insulator. So there are two different types of cables. There is a type A, and this is a type B. So I could think of buying these cables from two different companies company A and company B and I do a testing independently in my lab and these are the sample numbers that I have okay now clearly in this case the number of samples are also different so I have bought many more of these than I have bought of type B in this case of course I need to know the, the variance and so variance you know somehow I know is 40 for type A and it is 100 for type B. So I know that the underlying distribution A of A is much sharper. So I, uh, but I do not know what the mean is. Okay. So I want to be able to find the 95% confidence interval for mu A minus mu B. So we've already looked at this previously. So I can find out X bar. I can find out Y bar. I know what is sigma 1 square is 40. Sigma 2 square is 100 and I can calculate the num count the number of samples and I plug it in to be able to give me that interval. So you have 14 samples of A and 12 samples of B. Okay, And you get a value of minus 19.6 and minus 6.5. So if you have been able to understand everything that we have discussed in this class, you should be able to interpret this. I think interpretation is more important than just knowing the tools of how to achieve or arrive at this at this interval. So clearly, I should be able to say that the that mu two has is smaller is uh, larger than mu one, and so the voltage that cables from company B can withstand is much higher than the voltage that cables from company A can withstand. So which cable will you buy? Okay, so think about it. So you'll buy the better cable which can withstand a higher voltage. So you will end up buying cables from company B. Okay, let's go to the next case. And this is the case where sigma 1 square and sigma 2 square are unknown. So as you would imagine in this particular case, we would 
uh, use our intuition and try to replace sigma 1 square with s1 square, the sample variance, and sigma 2 square with s2 square, the sample variance. Unfortunately, when you do this, this is a very complicated distribution. It is not like a T distribution or, a, or any other distributions that we have seen. And <clears throat> so in this particular case, uh, uh, you know, we will not proceed further because this distribution is far too complicated. So we will make another assumption <coughs> in the case when sigma 1 square and sigma 2 square are unknown. And we will say that sigma 1 square equals sigma 2 square. Okay. So we'll say that the variance in population A equals to the variance in population B, in which case I can, you know, it becomes a simpler problem. So uh, I will uh, encourage you to find out what is the term, I forget now, but data which have different means but same variances have a special term. It's called heteroscedastic uh, distribution or heteroscedastic uh, populations, which means they have the same variance. So for such uh, variances, you, have, uh, you, you can think of them as a common variance. In such a case, I can look at the two distributions of S1 square and S2 square, and just because they have different number of data points, they I can find they belong to distri different distributions because the degrees of freedom are different, but we know that both of them belong to chi-square. Okay. So we take information of distribution A, distribution 2, which we have in form of this statistic for the two distributions and we pull them up. So we say that the net distribution is, uh, you can add them up and in, you know, in the beginning we had seen that if you add up two chi-square variables, then it is also a chi-square variable. Two independent chi-square variables is also a chi-square variable where the degrees of freedom and add up. So this is a chi-square with n minus one this is a chi-square with m minus 1. So together they become a chi-square with n plus m minus 2. Okay. So in this case, I will think of this pooled variance belonging to this chi-square distribution. And I will call it as SP, the pooled sample variance. Okay. So essentially what I've done is I have, I've, assuming that I know that the two variances are equal, I have added up information from the two variances together in order to come up with a pooled sample variance. Okay. So in this case, it turns out that x bar minus y bar is, is, a, is also a normal distribution like we discussed before with the variances being added up but in this, but when we do not uh, know what is the underlying distribution, we use the information of the pooled variance. And this particular variable we can show, or this particular standardized variable we can show belongs to a chi-square distribution, or I'm sorry, a T distribution with n plus m minus two degrees of freedom. So again, why does it belong to a T distribution? And you should be able to show that this over here is a Z variable. Okay. And this has been divided by a chi-square variable. And when you do that, you get a T distribution. And the degrees of freedom depend on the degrees of freedom of the chi-square variable, which was N plus M minus 2. Okay. So we do the same exercise again. We know that x bar minus y bar uh, standardized using the pooled variance in this particular way has a t distribution with degrees of freedom n plus m minus 2. So we use our old trick again and we write it in this particular way which then allows us to give, you know, uh, us to write down the confidence interval for uh, for 
uh, mu1 minus mu2. So if I now rewrite this algebraically, I will be able to write that this mu1 minus mu2 belong to this confidence interval. Okay. So note that we are using a pooled variance. A pooled, and why are we calling it a pooled variance? We're calling it because we are pooling data from uh, from distribution A and distribution B in order to calculate that common variance sigma square. That's why we call it a pooled variance. Okay, so let's take an example where you estimate the difference in mean of two normal populations with unknown but same variance. So it's the same example of testing the uh, cables, uh, insulation cables. But here we will make an underlying assumption that the sigma square, in the previous example, we had taken it as 40 and 100. But here we'll take that the sigma square is constant. Okay, but unknown. So the first step you will do is find out the pooled variance, which turns out to be 79. So you can see it is a weighted average. The average of the variance of the sample variance of cables in population A and uh, variance of cables in population B, and it is weighted with the number of samples that you had. Okay. So again, you know now how to use this. You can calculate this particular distribution and you will find that this distribution has degrees of freedom 24 because it is n plus m minus 2 so it is 12 plus 14 minus 2 so it is 24 and that number turns out to be minus 20.26 and minus 5.83 okay so in uh, so uh, in interest of time, let me stop here and I will take off uh, from the last item, which is calculating a confidence interval for a population variance. Uh, this I will do in my next class. So let me please stop here and uh, please do not forget to write back uh, in terms of uh, what was your experience. If you want to give me any ideas on how I could change my presentation. Uh, please do write back. Okay, thank you. Uh, stay safe and until the next time.